Hi, everybody. I'm Dave Shore. Thanks for joining me. This is Live at Five. We're back after a week off for the holiday last weekend. If you're just joining me for the first time, this is what I do in my office here in downtown Raleigh, North Carolina to wrap up the work week. I work at the ALS Association, North Carolina chapter. Uh, just like all of you, you put in a, a hard week. And so what I do is a hobby is I, I produce content, just like I, I did for over 30 years in the broadcast industry. This is my chance to to catch up with some of my friends and hopefully share some of our inspirational stories. So this is how we do it on LinkedIn Live, on Facebook Live, and on YouTube Live as well. Please add your comments and questions below. I've got a very special guest and longtime friend today. So without further ado, let's get going. And welcome, everybody. It is time for a brand new edition of Live at Five on a Friday. It is five o'clock somewhere. We just happened to get it a little bit earlier on the East Coast. I welcome in my guest today, longtime friend Brandon Noble. Brandon played years in the NFL. That's where we met. But now we catch up for the first time in a long time, even though we've uh, been keeping up on social media. Brandon, how you doing? I'm doing well, man. Dave, this is awesome. I was I was excited when you asked me to do this. I obviously look like I've worked a full day just like you, and uh, and I have, man. I, I am down in uh, Sea Isle City, New Jersey, where I own a restaurant, and uh, we've had a full day of service, and I'm getting ready to uh, to set up our late-night window here in a couple hours and work the, uh, the, the graveyard shift and serve all the, the wonderful patrons of the bars here in Sea Isle City some good, delicious cheese steaks and all that fun stuff. Oh, that is wonderful. Now, how did you get involved in the restaurant business? It's not an easy one. Oh, it's a, it's a hard one. It's been a really hard one over the last year, year and a half. Uh, it's been terrible. Um, but, you know, so uh, I got a, a, I moved back to Philadelphia, the Philadelphia area, after I retired from the NFL. My wife is, is originally from outside of Philadelphia. Um, I'm originally from Virginia Beach. Moved up here, coached football for a while. Uh, I'm still a, a high school football coach. Uh, and, a, and a friend of ours uh, that, that my wife, Mary Kate, grew up with has owned bars and restaurants for his whole life. And he and I have talked about doing something multiple times. And it's funny, you know, when you're in the NFL, everybody tells you never open a restaurant, never open a bar. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and there's a reason for that. And uh, and and but you know what? The, the timing just seemed right. I was looking for something to do. I really didn't want to get back into coaching. And that's kind of where I was. I've been out of coaching for about five or six years now professionally like where I actually get paid to do it and uh didn't want to do it because I know the sacrifice that your family has to kind of deal with in, in that world and and uh Tommy Brower my business partner hit me up just kind of at the right time and I bought two of his business partners out of a, a breakfast re breakfast restaurant called Bright Spot Cafe uh we were originally in Exton Pennsylvania we're now in Newtown Square uh and then this winter we got this opportunity to to take over a really well-known and established breakfast place at the Jersey Shore, and we jumped at it. And so, so now here we are at Shubies, which is down in Sea Isle City, uh, you know, New Jersey. And and yeah, and now I look like this, right? I mean, I don't look look like anything of those those pictures that you put up, man. I was like, when you put the one the, the headshot of me with the the suit and tie, I was like, oh, people are going to be like, who is this guy that Dave pulled out of the out of a dumpster this morning? I, I, I had to do it. It was just such a great collage that you had in, you know, all the stolen material that I can find is always the best material. But, um, look, you know, sometimes I share stories from my past. Brandon, let me tell you this one. Here's here's where I first heard uh, about um, the advice not to own your own restaurant. OK, this came from current Miami manager Don Mattingly. Late 80s, my first TV market, Evansville, Indiana. Uh Donnie Baseball was uh, an all-star first baseman with the Yankees, and he would spend the offseason in his hometown of Evansville, Indiana. He owned Mattingly's 23 restaurant, and after the newscast, we'd go over, shoot a little hoops in his uh, in his restaurant, and I would often find Donnie doing the dishes back in the back during his days of being an all-star first baseman with the Yankees. And so when that restaurant went under, Donnie always said, Unless you're there all the time, uh, it's a tough, tough business. So much respect to you, Brandon, and your business partners, because we need it. We love good restaurants with character. And so kudos to you that you're putting on a good show there. 
Thanks. Yeah, I mean, and you're look. I was look at me. I, I was busting tables today. I mean, you're, you're, you're exactly right. I was busting busting some tables, and 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 like I said, I'm gonna work the 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 midnight to three a.m. shift this morning to to serve some food. So, but you know what though, Ossie Dave, like I and and he's right. Like you've got to be hands on. You've got to be in the building. Yeah. And I think that's where, especially when you're a professional athlete, it seems like a great idea. Somebody else is gonna take care of it. Uh, this is not something I could have done when I was playing football. This isn't something I could have done 10, 15 years ago when I had little kids. Uh, my kids are all teenagers or going to college. So, you know, I'm, I'm in a spot right now where I can do it. And to be completely honest with you, I absolutely love it. I mean, this is as much fun as I have had in a long, long time. And it's coming out of a pandemic. I mean, where we have been shut down for 18 months. Um, but the similarities – between running a restaurant and athletics and a team sport are are ridiculous. I mean, it's every single day you know exactly what you have to do. Every yep. single day that doesn't happen, you know, and every single day everybody has to execute whatever their job is multiple times, and that never happens, right? So it's just, I mean, it is exactly like a week of football, a football game, uh, and, and communication and all the little things that go on. I mean, it really is a team environment every day, and, and I love it. I mean, it, it's just it's as close to home as I've felt in a long, long time. As far as you know, you know what what I loved about sports. Now we talk business on this show, so a lot of people out there they're wondering economically how everybody's going to come out of of COVID and the and the pandemic. How has the restaurant business? We all went to carry out. And online orders. How is the restaurant business going to change forever because of what we went through? Well, I, I do think you see a lot more people doing a lot more carryout. But but the other thing, though, is honestly, Dave, um, you know, we I think we got more efficient. I think you became very conscious of um, your online presence and how things looked and how to do takeout and those kinds of things. But I have found that over the last couple of months that we've been open up here in Pennsylvania, New Jersey people want to come sit in a restaurant again and hang out with their friends and talk and do the things that we all used to do pre-COVID. So I, I really found that even though we're still doing takeout, even though we're still doing things um, in, in, a, in a different clip right now, we're still not full speed. Um, people want to come and have that experience again where they sit down at a restaurant, somebody walks up to the table, takes their order, you know what I mean? Like, and and they sit and enjoy it, and and we we missed that. So I do think that the restaurant industry, as the world opens up, is one of those ones that will probably go back to normal relatively quickly, depending on the locality's kind of rules and regulations. Um, but but I have definitely found that people want to come out, they want to sit down, they want to have a waiter or a waitress, uh, they want to have their drinks, they they want the whole experience right now. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a great point. Uh, a lot of people will watch this uh, not live; they'll watch it this weekend on YouTube. So, um, but if you are watching live on LinkedIn or Facebook or YouTube, please put your comments or questions uh, down below. I'm able to put them on the screen. But uh, when I shared this on Facebook, uh, Brandon, you have a lot of friends that um, uh, that are we're excited about this. So hopefully they'll watch it on YouTube. Just uh, search Shore Sports Media and. You'll find it on YouTube, and please subscribe to the channel. Okay, here's how we met. I was covering the Dallas Cowboys in the 2000s. Um, Brandon played defensive tackle for the Cowboys. And in my job in the media and traveling with the Cowboys, especially when you probably lost more games than you won, oh, yeah. my hard job was to go into the locker room after the game, and I had a couple of go-to guys that in a win or loss, I knew I was going to get something good. In your years, it was Brandon Noble and Greg Ellis. If I couldn't get you two, I didn't have anything. So uh, thank you for always being there, Brandon. That's how I, we met. I appreciate it. It is how we met. And th those were uh, – those experiences uh, are, are hard as a player, right? You know, to be in the locker room, especially – you know, in the, with the Cowboys, right? Because that was, you know, like you said, early 2000s. So I made it in Dallas in 99 and then yeah. rolled through there till about 2003. And they're coming off all of those great years. And the, 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 I almost called it the, the, the franchise is really struggling to find itself again. Uh, and, 
and yeah, I mean, look, it's it's no fun to answer those questions week in and week out. You know, why are you guys so bad? What's happening? You know, how do you fix it? And and when you don't have any of those answers, especially, but uh, it definitely helped me kind of uh, you know get used to being in front of a camera and get used to talking to people in, in a way. And look, I, I use it in the restaurant. I mean, this last weekend we were we were short. You know, we were short in the kitchen a little bit, and I was going out and telling people, "Hey, you know, you know, we're, we're going to." I apologize for the the better that I got. Um, you know, dealing with with you guys on a day to day basis and being in front of a camera, I knew that I wanted to yeah. go into broadcasting afterwards, uh, and, and it's definitely helped me a lot. You know, being a guy that. That, that you guys felt comfortable coming and talking to uh, makes me feel more comfortable now when I do it. I've been doing it for, for a while now. Um, but, but yeah, those were, those were tough ones, man. There, there's no doubt about it. Being on a five and 11 Cowboys team uh, is, is not a good time. If I remember right, uh, you closed out Emmett's career. You played with a hall of famer. What do you remember yeah. that, uh, that stood out about Emmett Smith? One of the greatest of all time. Well, I, number one, I mean, obviously he is. So I, I grew up a, a Chicago Bears fan. So I, I was a huge Walter Payton fan. And Walter was a yep. guy that, that played on a lot of really, really bad football teams and still had the NFL rushing record. Uh, and so to be there in Dallas and watch Emmett Smith break Walter Payton's record uh, and, and to be his teammate, right, to, to be a guy that went out there day in and day out and worked with them. Uh, the thing that I tell everybody about him, and this this goes for guys like Mike Irvin and um, you know Troy Aikman, the Darren Woodson, the, the the guys that are Hall of Famers that that I played with, um, Larry Allen, right? Like they came to work every single day and were and were pros. Like Emmett was in the weight room during the off season before anybody else, and he stayed longer than he did all the stuff that we did, and then he did more. And this is at the end of a Hall of Fame career, right? You know, to watch that guy work during the offseason when no one's there. That, to me, was where I, I was like, man, I, I tell people about that all the time. Like, I, I was really lucky to be around a lot of guys that, that are that are going to be in the Hall of Fame or are in the Hall of Fame already. And there's a reason, right? They're ridiculously talented athletically, but there are so many guys that are ridiculously talented athletically that play in the NFL but the guys that are able to maximize that because of how they work and prepare and take care of themselves, they're only a handful. And they're the ones that go to camp. They're the ones that get the, the jacket. Uh, and that's why Emmett was who he was. Man, that guy absolutely outworked everybody. And again, on bad football teams, right? 5-11 and 11 football teams with no one around him anymore, he still showed up and worked like he did when they won Super Bowls. Um. You, another guy that, that wears a jacket, that yellow jacket, is Larry Allen. You mentioned him. He probably said zero words in a microphone to me and probably the least number of words to me other than a, a, a short laughter that he would have. But did you ever have to lock up with this guy? What made him a staple and, and a Hall of Famer on the offensive line? Uh, Larry is uh, maybe the – one of the most terrifying people you'll ever line up against. And at the same time, one of the nicest guys in the entire world, right? You know, Larry definitely didn't talk a lot. Dave, you are spot on. Uh, I'm glad <laughs> I've never had to try and interview him. Um, even, even, you know, I, I was a teammate of his for four years and we talked, right? I mean, we smashed into each other every single day. So we definitely talked. Um, but Larry, he would give you that big grin and kind of laugh and shrug his shoulders. And, and, uh, and he was incredible. Larry, Larry Allen, uh, was the rare combination of a guy that had, again, that even more ridiculous level of athleticism, some kind of like creature, like brute strength, um, and then could just play the game. I mean, he was just, he was so technically sound. Uh, I, I remember, you know, one of my first camps it was my first camp with Dallas it was in 99 and I'm just trying to make the team and I'm slowly <laughs> kind of working my way up the depth chart right and so as you get kind of higher and higher in the depth chart next thing you know you're playing against the twos and the ones right and and so in practice all of a sudden I find myself in a goal line period playing the three technique which is kind of on the outside shoulder of the guard and it's Larry Allen and Flozell Adams standing in front of me right and you're just like 
here I am, right? I'm a six foot one, 280 pound, you know, first year defensive tackle. And here's LA and Flozell. Flozell's, you know, six, a hundred and, you know, 320 pounds. And LA's, you know, six, four, 340 pounds. And like the sun just disappears. You know what I mean? And you're just like, I'm just going to try and survive this snap and, uh, and play. But, but Larry was really, really special. Again, prepared, always showed up to work, battled through injuries, and then just had that ridiculous, like, I don't, I don't know that I've ever seen anyone that physically strong that could take it to the football field. I think that's where, where he separated himself with Larry. There's a video on YouTube somewhere of Larry Allen bench pressing 700 pounds. I, I remember. I mean, and like that number, that's a ridiculous squat, right? Or deadlift. But Larry benched it like it was like 315 for the rest of us. And and he could a lot of times there are guys, Dave, that, that were really, really strong, but couldn't transition that strength onto the football field. But Larry could. And so when Larry hit you, it you he hit you with all of that. And I and I remember so I went after I played with the Cowboys, I went on and played with the Redskins. And so I had to play against Larry. And so I practiced against Larry every single day in practice. I remember in camp, you know, you'd be kind of like, hey, man, Larry, like, how many reps are you taking today? You know what I mean? Like, how hard are you How hard are you really going? You know, but, like, I played against him in Washington. And this was at the end of my career. You know, this is like year seven or eight. And my insides were sore. Not my muscles. Not my joints. But, like, my liver, right? You know what I mean? Like, my kidneys. Like, my lungs. Yeah. Um, it was one of those things, Dave, where like I really I felt like I, I've been in a couple minor knock on wood car wrecks. And that's what it felt like. Like it wasn't the normal kind of soreness. It was it was like, you know, interior bleeding kind of stuff. And and that's just Larry was special like that. And, and an absolute to me, the best offensive lineman to ever play the game, hands down. When you uh came upon a team, was there anybody uh, from an offensive situation that you said, I don't know what it is, but I have pretty luck, good luck against this guy. Is it whether on an offensive line or a or a backfield uh, offensive player? Yeah, you know, I, I always played really well against um, the Redskins, which is kind of okay. funny because that's who I went and played for for three years after I left Dallas. Um, but something for me about the, the Reds, and maybe it's because I grew up in Virginia, and yep. that's where all my buddies are Redskins fans. Um, and, and so like, I always had really good games to me. Look, I, I was a, um, it may not look like it, but a cerebral guy, right? Like I made it in the NFL because like I could study the game and I understood kind of what was going on out there. And so division opponents, NFC East opponents, I always played better against because I knew them, right. The, the study was, was that much easier and actually that much more deep, more detailed, because I wasn't learning something new, right? I was I was watching the Redskins for the ninth time in four years, so so for me it was always the Redskins, the Eagles, and the Giants that I played best against, mostly because of familiarity and understanding what they were about to do before they did it, which allowed me to kind of overcome some some physical shortcomings that that I might have had, you know, pl- playing at that level. I just I just remembered something that popped in when we talked about Larry Allen. I one of those seasons I I signed Rocket Ishmael to do a player show with. Okay. So we did a weekly show out at a restaurant. And and each week I'd tell him, why don't you bring one of your teammates? So one week he's like, let's get it, Larry Allen. He's he's so good. I said, Rocket, I are you sure? Have you ever heard Larry say much? And he goes, Oh, no problem. He brought him out. And Larry said about like three words every question and then laughed. And Rocket looks at me during a commercial. He's like, Woo! <laughs> you were right. I love it. I love it. Rocket was awesome. Rocket's one of those guys, man. You talk about energy. Holy smokes. And and, and yeah, and Rocket could talk. Rocket's locker was like right next to mine. So he bu- 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 right. And then LA. Yeah, LA probably had a dip in his mouth. He was probably spitting into something yep. and chuckled every couple of minutes. <laughs> Really deep like that. That that's Larry. That's funny. I love that story. No, that is so funny, Brandon Noble. You are so much fun to talk about. Let, uh, you played at Penn State, and we just talked about greats you played f- for and with in the NFL. Um, what did you learn playing under Joe Paterno? I've been asked that question a lot recently, and and there, I mean, it's really hard to put your finger on one thing, Dave. I, I think the biggest thing for me is, you know, Joe 
as as good as we were on the field, it was more important for him that we turned into good men. And and I think as, as I've become a father and a high school football coach and and done all the things that I've done, um, I, I really want to make sure that that's the position that my boys are in, that my my daughter's in, right? When they're around people, the the, the goal is not to make them a great football player, in my daughter's case, swimmer, right? But to make them better people. Um, and and that to me, Joe was that, right? Joe was your dad um, telling you to do things that you didn't want to do when you didn't want to do them. And then 10, 15 years later, you go, oh, like, I get it, right? I understand why he said to take care of the little things, because if you take care of the little things, the big things take care of themselves, right? You know, it's all those little coaching cliches that we have, but Joe lived them and he meant them. Like, I remember, Joe, this is the truth. So I got, I got two Joe stories here. So the first one is he really had this thing about us cutting corners and taking shortcuts. And I remember yeah. walking through campus one day, and Penn State is huge, walking through campus one day and cutting across some grass and like not, not taking the right angle on the sidewalk. Yeah. And I don't know where he was or where he came from, but all of a sudden – He's like yelling. You get this like, no, but what are you doing? You're, you're running. You're cutting corners here. You cut corners everywhere. Right. And you're just like, where was he in a bush? You know, where did he come from? Like, it's the middle of the day on campus. And then and then the other thing is, I mean, you look at me now, right? I've got this big beard. I've got this long hair. Um, Joe, we were super clean shaven, clean cut. And in the NFL, I did the same thing. I grew my beard out. I had some long hair for a while. And I remember going back at the end of my career and I was literally trying to avoid him. I was trying to sneak through the office to see all the coaches that I wanted to see and not see Joe because I had a beard. And Dave, man, I walk around the corner and I hear him coming and it's the same thing, right? He looks at me. He recognizes me. Now, this is probably 2004 or five. So instead of being a six foot one, 260 pound, bald head, clean shaved kid, I was now a six foot one. 310 pound guy with a huge head of hair and a giant beard and same thing right no well you haven't shaved in years you know you can't afford a razor right i mean all that money they're giving you and he grabs me by the ear i mean not literally right but he grabs me by the elbow walks me into his office sits me down proceeds to like kind of chew me out for 10 minutes about my hair and my beard and then asks how my parents are doing in virginia beach you know, but but that was the kind of guy he was. Like, it didn't matter if it was, you know, 1995 or 2006, right? He wanted you to be a good person. And that, that was what was important to him. And I think I've tried to do that um, in, in, my own, in my own life with my kids and the kids that I coach. I've been blessed in sports talk radio days to have employees uh, who were former athletes. So in, in Los Angeles, Keyshawn Johnson, Marcellus Wiley, two of the – better employees because they love feedback. Athletes are used to getting feedback and having thick skin. Um, am I correct? I mean, that's that's a great lesson that you oh, learn yeah. in sports. Yeah. Yeah. You, you need it. I mean, you because that's the rest of your life, right? People are always, if you can't get better, right, you're, you're, you're never going to go anywhere. And, and I think that that's an important lesson that we miss a little bit right now with 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 our young people because of the way. Again, I'm like I'm father. I got three teenagers. I got two in one in college, one going to college, and one's a sophomore in high school. So, um, you know, to be coachable is so important. And it's not coachable like on the field for the rest of your life. It's be able to take direction, be able to get help, be able to take constructive criticism or or an ask to them. Pardon my French, yeah. right? And then use it a constructive way to make yourself better, to get the job done the way that you're supposed to do it. That's a huge part of being an athlete. And it's a huge part of being an adult or being successful. So if you don't have that ability to do it, uh, it you're going to struggle. What, what part has changed about being coached as a high schooler in the nineties compared to how you would coach a high schooler in 2000 and, and twenties now? Oh man. Like how long do you have? Um, <laughs> Everything. What's changed and what hasn't changed about how you motivate think, and discipline? I think, Dave, I, I'm really fortunate, right? So I, I am um, – I, I work for a guy. I'm the defensive coordinator at Downingtown East High School. I work for a guy that is as old school as 
could possibly be. He's like my high my high school football coach was. Um, yeah, we are very tough on the kids. It's about accountability. Um, there okay. is definitely a different way of speaking to people now. That uh, you know, there's definitely not as many f bombs, uh, not as many curse words, not as many derogatory words that are thrown at you. Yeah. Um, and you, you do have to be careful with that stuff now. Uh, and and look, you, you do have to treat them different, right? You talk about concussions, you talk about t- physical toughness. Um, there's a real fine line because of how the game has changed that that you can't do anymore that we used to be that coaches used to do to us. And I'm not saying it's better or worse. I'm just saying that those are the big, big differences. Okay, that I think that's very, very important. Um, some of the things that you you point out there. Um, it so it's a different personality type of athlete now, also, right? In in how they've been raised, and it's a it's a different parent. Yeah, it's a different parent, and that that's the big thing, Dave. Right? Is and, and I'm not knocking parents at all. I'm a, I'm one myself. Um, but you're dealing with parents that are way more hands-on and also don't always – like my dad would have taken the side of the high school football coach, right? Yeah. Well, why did okay. he make you run 50 laps, right? What did you do, right? That's the question that my father would have asked me, um, whereas now it's the other way around, right? It, it's, you know, why are you making little Jimmy run so much, uh, you know? those kinds of things it's it's definitely different like I'm really like I said I'm really lucky to live in an area where high school football is important um where the high school football coach is super old school and he's been doing it long enough to where the people in the community respect him and he puts out good kids and good young men and so they understand how important it is so it is very similar like I said you know we take concussion seriously. We take those things seriously. Um, but these kids are coached really, really hard, and I know it's not like that at other places. That's very uh, fascinating. So we get some parents that are watching this right now. Uh, if they've got young kids, tell them a thing or two that you would recommend about, A, getting them involved in athletics and how to prepare them for that experience. Experience. Uh, I, I think – get your kids involved in athletics, whether they want okay. to or not. Uh, you know, don't, don't, don't force them into something, let them find something that they enjoy. It might mean they play, you know, three or four different sports or they find one that they love right away. Um, but definitely get them involved in it for a couple of reasons. The first one being right. You're going to, you're going to learn to be in an environment where someone's telling you you're doing something wrong. And as a parent, that's a good thing. If, if my kid can go out, and learn from someone else and take criticism, I know that they're going to be able to go out into the world and handle things, right? Um, the other thing is, is is tell them it's okay, right? Support the coach, right? Support the fact, that, hey, look, you know, again, you know, like, look, coach yelled at me today. Well, why did he yell at you? Like, what happened, right? Well, okay, what really happened? Why? Oh, you made that mistake. Well, maybe coach is trying to make you a better football player or a better whatever. Like, I tell, and I tell parents this, I tell kids this, my job as a coach is to make you better than you think you can be. That's a hard process. That's not something that's easy to go through as a player. I, all of my best coaches were guys that most days I wanted to punch them in the face, but I love them now. They're guys that made me a better man. And, and I think that as, as a parent, if you can get your kid into those kinds of situations, um, and it, again, that doesn't mean they're getting, you know, it's not, nasty is not derogatory right like done the right way with good people good people involved um it's good for you but my, my oldest son plays football at temple uh my daughter is going to go swim at bryant university my youngest okay, son plays, plays football for us at downingtown east um and, and athletics is an important part of, of of them growing up because it's going to make them a lot tougher mentally and physically than people that don't. And, and in today's world, you need that. I mean, you really do. And that, that's a skill set. Like you said, if you're a college athlete and that's on your resume, that's huge. That is huge because the employer knows this is a person that I can coach. This is a person that will work hard. It's going to be self-motivated, disciplined. If they played college sports or high school sports, they can do the things that I need them to do in whatever environment that is. Physically, you played it at the highest level, Brandon. You took, I'm sure, a lot of hits. You put a lot on the line with your body. How has it affected you today? 
look at me. I mean, look at this. <laughs> this is how it affected me. Um, uh, you know, I mean, look, Dave. I I think I'm 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 fortunate. I guess I I, I feel I feel good. I mean, I do. I, yeah, I've okay, lost good. a ton of weight. Um, you know, I, I played it around anywhere between 300 and 320 pounds. I'm probably 265 now. I've I've dipped down. My my mid pandemic weight was 250 because I was running every day with my wife. Um, I'm not doing that anymore. Uh, but um, you know, I I've got I've got bad knees, bad ankles, bad hips, bad shoulders, bad neck. Uh, my chiropractor looks at me like I'm a crazy person when I walk in there. Um, but but Dave, man, that that's a part of the deal. You know, I had five yeah. knee surgeries. I'm bone on bone in both of my knees. Um, I, I tore my ACL, my MCL, my PCL, and dislocated my kneecap and my left knee all at once. Um, so it, it's a part of it, man. It's it's just a part of it, and and I don't I don't. I don't want anybody to feel bad for me because I literally would go do it again tomorrow if, if they let me and they won't because of all the bad things that have happened to my body at this point. But, uh, but it, but it really is. It's, it's an honor to be able to have played in the NFL and to play college football, uh, to be able to do what you want to do. Uh, to th the, I think the thing, man, that, that makes it all okay for me is like, I am a very, one of the very few people that has been able to achieve the dream that they had from the time they were four years old and do the thing that they love more than anything else in the entire world, minus my wife and kids, right? Like that, that thank God for Mary Kate and my children. Yeah. I would be lost Amen. without them. I would be lost without them now. I mean that sincerely. If I did not have them in my life post football or during my transition out of football, I don't know what would have happened to me. Um, but they they have made it all better because I've got something else that I love that way. Um, so it was all worth it. I mean, look, man, you know, there's some days I can't walk down the stairs. There's other days I bounce around the house like I'm 18 years old. You know, it just depends on the weather. Okay. Well, I, I, I wanted to make sure because every guy's got their own story. All right. I'm not keeping you for very much longer because you're a businessman. But if, if you're in um, school today at Penn State, you'd be able to take advantage of the naming, imaging, and licensing so you'd be able to market yourself, Brandon Noble. What do you think about that? I, I I don't know. I have a tough time wrapping my head around it, man. Like I could barely go to school when I was in college, uh, you know. And, and but but kids are so much more savvy when it comes to that kind of stuff now in that world. Um, I, I don't I don't know. I, I'm I'm re I really am Dave having a tough time. Like I like I like the fact that they have the opportunity. I'm concerned about the fact that they have the opportunity, if that makes Me any too. sense at all. Um, I, I do think that we're getting to where, especially with college football, like it to me was about as, after being in the NFL especially, about as pure as it gets. I know there's, you know, there, there's things there, right? But like you're playing a game, every game matters, all, all the things that, you know, college football was for me. I don't know if it is anymore. And that's okay. But but I yeah. I do I do think that it's going to create some issues from a recruiting perspective. I think it's going to create some locker room issues. Uh, I I do think it adds a layer of difficulty to being a football coach right now. Uh, I coached college football for eight years after I retired from the NFL. I couldn't imagine doing it right now in this environment. Um, but look, man, if a kid can go out and make fifty bucks, a hundred bucks, you know, to to get people to play video games or to rep a you know a I don't know, a wing joint or what? I mean, look, man, I'd have been happy if somebody gave me free wings and beer. I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, like that, I mean, that, that would have been perfect for me um, to use this face and this body for, for your advertising. Uh, God bless you. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I like I said, I, I don't know how I would have navigated it because believe it or not, I, I, especially in college, man, I was super self-conscious and I don't know uh, that I would have wanted to put myself out there like that. So it's a it's a it's a crazy new world that that we're kind of heading into with college football, um, and and I and I hope that guys figure out how to do it and make some money, and then when they do it, they don't spend that money on dumb stuff. Uh, you know, I, I personally, it, my my solution to the whole thing, right, is if you want to pay these kids, put their money into some sort of investment fund that they can't touch until they're fifty, um, and then and then give it to them then or twenty five or whatever it is, right? You know what I mean, like. I think this it's the wild, wild west right now. It'll be it'll be interesting to see what the next five years of college football looks like.
Yeah, yeah, I think this came about so quickly that I don't think they have it figured out. So you mentioned Whoa. it, and I mentioned it to somebody yesterday. This is going to be the wild, wild west. There's going to be some problems early on because they won't have any regulation of it. And, of course, you're dealing with the NCAA here, and and they have trouble with oversight anyway. So They have trouble with everything. They, they yeah. are not very good at much except collecting money. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's why I worry about it uh, because you're going to have a lot of agents and a lot of marketers out there uh, it, overextending some of these kids. Right. Yeah. How, how are you going to vet all these people? Right. As, as a college football coach, I go, all right, now I've got my room, right. I've got my guys. How do I make sure that they're being taken care of? Right. And they're not getting taken advantage of, you know, or putting themselves signing a contract that, you know, puts them on the hook for, you know what I mean? I, I, I just don't know, man. I, I, I hope that it goes through a good process and they figure it out without, too many casualties, right? I mean, that, that that's really the best that we can hope for at this point. All right, Brandon, it's been a lot of fun. This is the way I catch up. I know we try our best to stay in touch, but it's been a lot of fun. I'm going to come visit the restaurant sometime. So, and so get the bourbons ready so I can taste a couple of bourbons. Okay. Oh, absolutely, man. We will definitely pour some bourbon next time I see you. Wherever okay. that is. Uh, give my best to Mary yeah. Kate. Will do. And and, and take care of yourself. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dave. Good to see you, man. All right. Good to see you, too. B. Nob. That's what I always called him. Uh, Brandon Noble joining me here on Live at Five. Um, thank you so much, uh, everyone. If you joined on some of the other shows, I want to thank everyone uh, who participated and donated on Facebook um, to my ALS fundraiser. Uh, was able to surpass uh, over $4,000 from uh, those of you out there. And, and and throughout the state state of North Carolina, we have raised over six hundred and fifty thousand dollars as well. Um, and uh, as Brandon knows, there's a lot of uh, of his former brothers and and others from the NFL who have um, who have faced ALS, and and so do so many others. So um, next week we'll have a brand new guest. But I think that was a lot of fun. If you haven't um, subscribed on YouTube, please do that. Shore Sports Media. I try to spend a little time making that uh, channel look a little bit better, but you'll uh, you'll get a chance to see Mark Followell uh, and some of the past guests that I've had as well. Those are the most recent ones. Uh, Larry Potash from WGN TV. There's a whole host of fun ones. Uh, Jerry Valencourt, Jerry V with a little NBA talk. Uh, so we try to have some fun each and every week. My thanks to Brandon Noble. My thanks to all of you for joining. Have a blessed weekend and be safe out there. We'll see you next week on Live at Five.